Hey everyone, welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. We're going to talk market recovery. I feel like every day we get a completely different vibe based on what's happening in the market. Yesterday we sort of gave up all the day's gains leading into the close. Today it's the opposite, renewed optimism as the market again retests the S&P, that, that key 2750 level. Got some friends to help us out this week. Jesse Felder from The Felder Report is going to join us in a bit to uh, give his take on the big picture environment. Also, we'll dig into the healthcare sector. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey everyone, welcome to today's show. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com. Appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close to break down the day's charts, the day's technical action, connect the short-term movements of today with the long-term trends. And if, if you've not gotten enough volatility yet, we get a renewed upswing today, recovering from yesterday's sell-off and a continued push higher. Uh, you know, we polled uh, a number of stock charts viewers over the last couple of days about sector leadership and where you saw opportunities. So we're going to look at that poll later and talk about uh, one particular sector, healthcare. We're going to dig into it. A lot of people sort of, you know, speculated. Obviously, there's a lot of potential upside in, uh, you know, biotechs. You know, the the, the companies that are going to help us navigate through this uh, the coronavirus uh, experience. And we're going to look at the charts, though. Obviously, I think it's very easy in this sort of environment to get caught up in the anecdotal, caught up in the uh, the ideas, the narrative, what should work. And we're going to focus on what actually is working. Look for stocks with potentially good setups right about now. Uh, as I mentioned, we have Jesse Felder on the show today. We have some other great guests coming up uh, over the next uh, week or so. Tomorrow, we have John Kosar from Asbury Research. On Friday, markets are off. We're going to take a holiday as well. And we'll, we'll be back with you live on um, Monday, the 13th. Uh, next week, we have Brian Shannon, uh, expert in VWAP and also on uh, multiple time frames going to be joining us on the 14th. Then two other great events next week to point out. On the 13th, on Monday, our next episode of Behind the Charts is going to feature our conversation with Rick Bensignor from uh, In the Know Trader. Uh, he's worked with a lot of institutions. He'll share sort of his background from the trading floors to advising some of the top investors in the world. And then on the 15th, we'll feature our latest special event, The Big Board, digging into the New York Stock Exchange, profiling our visit to the floor of the exchange uh, just before the, uh, the holidays end of last year. Unforgettable experience. Uh, you're really going to enjoy a view from the floor. So a lot of good content coming up uh, for you on Stock Charts TV and on the final bar. Let's get to today's market recap. So as I mentioned, you know, yesterday it felt like Optimism in the morning, back to reality hitting in the afternoon. You can see looking at the last two days of the S&P, we really distributed into the close yesterday. I think that left me and a lot of others questioning the upside follow through, questioning the ability of the, of the market to have a sustained upside further than where it's come so far. You know, today, I think, uh, you know, certainly felt more optimistic. You had sort of nice buying going through the day besides sort of a, you know, sell off out of the, uh, in the first 30 minutes. We never really eclipsed uh, yesterday's close. We sort of then stepped on the gas and moved into fin finishing in a position of strength. You know, what's notable now is the S&P once again testing that 2750 level. It's just closed almost to the tick at 2750. Uh, now, you know, again, this, this level we've talked about for, for a little while now because it's using Fibonacci retracements, using a couple other um, methods sort of keying on, on that level. And the ability of the market to get above 2,700 to 2,750, I think, is, uh, is pretty key. So I think, once again, we've got a nice up move today. For me, it's all about the follow through tomorrow and whether we get, uh, we get are able to push through that 2,750 level, um, you know, with some further upside momentum or... The other side is this would further establish 2750 as just a key resistance level. So more to come tomorrow on what that means for us. In terms of cap tiers, mid caps and small caps up a little more. So mid caps up almost 5% today, small caps over 4%. The VIX now down to 43. Again, still very elevated relative to the long-term average levels of volatility, um, but, but again, down a lot from uh, the peak that we saw not too long ago. 
looking at a daily chart of the S&P and, and uh, with my guests, we're going to talk in a little bit looking at this chart and get his take on where we're at. Um, but again, I, you know, for me, as we're looking at this 2750 level, that's based on, you know, previous support. So if you look at a lot of, uh, you know, early 2019, we hit that 27 to 2750 level, ended up being support a number of times. Uh, now we've once again engaged that level. And this is also a Fibonacci retracement level. So it's, you know, 61.8% of the way down from that 2018 to 2020 rally. So there are a number of methods sort of pointing out on that 2750 level. You know, again, when you zoom way out, if we would sort of go further down from here and retest the lows, it would make a ton of sense technically that this is about where we'd, uh, where we'd peak out. But for me, again, it's all about the price, right? And as we are seeing, the price in the short term and the tactical time frame continues to make a pattern of higher highs and higher lows until that trend breaks. The short term, the tactical trend remains positive. We have to remember that. So on any pullback, you're looking at the previous lows around 2450, which is a pretty long way uh, off from where we're at now, all now testing 2750. And a break above 2750, I think, would confirm maybe potential further uh, short term upside. Let's look at the rest of the dashboard, see what sort of themes we can tease out in terms of sectors. You had some defensive sectors at the top here. So it was not the big tech driven rally that you'd sort of, uh, you know, anecdotally think of as a return to, you know, the, uh, the, um, uh, the juice returning to the, to the uh, higher beta leadership names. It was real estate number one, then energy number two, and then utilities number three. So the three sectors leading are not sort of the traditional leadership sectors you'd expect during a recovery phase. At the bottom, you had consumer staples, then communication services, and then technology. So all the consumer, both the consumer sectors, communication services, tech, sort of the leadership that you would expect in a big, you know, where everything's okay, we're in the clear. They're sort of down at the lower end of the range. And that's maybe one of the question marks I'm seeing looking at uh, today's rally. It was not driven by tech and consumer. Those were more at the bottom. And it was uh, driven almost more uh, as a search for yield, search for uh, search for safety of sorts. So we'll have to see again. I think what what sort of follow through we get uh, tomorrow in terms of sectors. You had Brasilia and Brazil, excuse me, Brazil and Russia. That was I combined Brazil and Russia into Brasilia, which were the number one and two sec, uh, uh, ETFs today. Uh, with Brazil up uh, just under five percent, leading the way. Um, on the downside, you had all the Asian markets, which really at the lower end of it. So Japan, the only ETF in our uh, group that we follow on the downside, followed by the Chinese ETFs, uh, essentially flat for the day. In terms of industry groups, again, it was a pretty diverse uh, mix. And I think you saw this yesterday as well. So even though we've been, you know, sort of tripping higher, it's not been, you know, a very focused uh, industry leadership uh, picture, I guess is how I would describe it. So mortgage rates, actually number one, uh, up almost 20% today, followed by aluminum, which is a group of materials. Then you had gambling, which is up almost 10% today. Uh, transportation, home construction. So the top five, sort of an interesting mix of sectors represented, but notably, I think home construction, gambling, hotels, these are three groups within consumer discretionary that it's actually pretty encouraging to see those uh, more at the uh, at the top of the list. On the downside, just a couple, I think noteworthy trucking, which is part of industrials, and also fixed line telecom, which would be things like, uh, you know, AT&T, I, I want to say are in that group. Um, so just a couple of, uh, of groups that were down. Also, golds and uh, gold miners and mining stocks up uh, a little bit, but again, nowhere near the uh, the leadership that you see from um, from others. So, you know, it was sort of an interesting mix of uh, the industry picture, the ETF picture, um, to uh, to pay attention to for sure. I want to wrap up this market recap looking at a couple other charts that are um, catching my eye. And uh, yesterday, if you saw our show, we ran out of time uh, to uh, to get to the three and three, so uh, we missed some of the. Um, some of the charts that I was hoping to share there. But again, one that I'm focused on is this one. This is looking at the advanced decline line, the, the leadership by cap tiers. And it's looking at the breadth picture. You know, what it feels like more and more as we have this little bounce this week, and it's not little, it's a pretty meaningful bounce. A lot of these advanced decline lines certainly appear to be putting in a higher low. And I, and I think, you know, one of the questions with a bear market rally, do you get the breadth confirming that? And I think a higher low is really good. Um, you'll notice, though, as the S&P has broken up to new swing highs, a lot of stocks breaking above their swing highs from the last week or two, the cumulative advanced decline lines have not quite done that yet. This isn't updated for today, so we'll have to see where this plays out. But, you know, I'd love to see a confirmation from breadth readings in like mid cap and small cap to confirm that the average stock or that the you know broader basket of stocks is, uh, is seeming to go to, uh, uh, to further upside, which would be good. 
You know, I think it's worth noting here, this is the um, stocks making new highs and new lows. And again, as much as I think mentally we want to uh, envision an all clear sign, a, you know, we did it sort of banner as the, as the market recovers and sees through it, you know, a lot of the breadth measures tell you that even with the upswing that we've seen, we're nowhere near that sort of declaration. We're still pretty far down from the February highs. The breadth picture remains relatively muted, so it's not like a lot of stocks are making new 52-week highs. Essentially, it's flat, a near zero number right now on the S&P, as well as on the New York Stock Exchange. So again, we're not, we're going to look in healthcare, some of the stocks that are actually recovering pretty well. Uh, but again, broadly speaking, we're not seeing that. Most stocks sort of down within that range, still trying to get above their 50 and 200 day moving averages. So again, 80, 87% of the S&P is still below uh, their 200 day moving averages. So plenty of, uh, of room to grow, to grow uh, room to improve before we feel like the, uh, uh, the longer term, more the medium term trend is in, uh, is in recovery phase of sorts. At this point, I think it still feels like sort of a bear market rally type of environment. Having said that, I want to get to our next segment, uh, the sector deep dive. What we like to do occasionally is dig deeply into a particular sector, start to unpack some of the themes that we can uh, look at. And as a way of introducing the sector today, I want to share with you a poll that we, uh, that we had on Stock Charts TV over the last couple of days. Um, on the Stock Charts TV window, if you're, if you're looking at it there on the right side, we always have a poll running. So I'd encourage you anytime you can uh, answer the poll because we love to use that, gather feedback from you uh, and, uh, and use it as a way to uh, understand how you're looking at things. And it's a great way of illustrating different themes. We asked you which sector you think will do best during this coronavirus outbreak period. And we gave you five choices, tech, staples, utilities, healthcare, financials. And 36% of you said healthcare, the XLV, that was number one, followed very closely by tech uh, with 34%. So 70% of you, over two thirds, responded either healthcare or technology, which is a pretty fair answer. After that, we dropped off a bit to staples, consumer staples around 21%. And then from there, pretty big drop off to uh, utilities and then financial. So only 3% of you, three out of 100 said financial. So if you're looking for a, um, you know, uh, out of benchmark uh, opinion or out of consensus opinion, you know, thinking of financials as leadership certainly feels like it based on uh, the responses we got here. But I wanted to focus on the number one response, which was healthcare. And I think that's a decent way of, of thinking about things. So let's look at the healthcare sector from a big picture. Let's look at the groups that make up healthcare. And then let's look at some of the individual names that make up those groups, see what sort of interesting charts we can come up with. So when I'm looking at the healthcare sector, again, each sector, you know, plays very differently. I, I remember as we were going into year end, I saw this great bottoming pattern, this basing pattern, sort of this, the low from uh, December of 2018, you had the peak from October and December of 18, that lined up with the peak from July. So when we broke out and retested it in October to November, broke out, boy, it felt like healthcare was the, that was the spot. And on a relative basis, breaking to new relative highs, all started to look very good. A lot of things changed, not just at the market high in February, but at the beginning of the year, right? That year end, the, the thing, things changed in a lot of ways. Groups that have been doing well started to underperform and, and vice versa. So healthcare, which looked like it was in a position to regain sort of its leadership momentum after being a relative performer for a number of months, started to roll over on a relative basis, underperformed in the first six weeks of the year. So leading into the market low, uh, healthcare was actually a, a non-factor. It was sort of a, a, a forget about it sort of sector as other groups, especially tech and others were, were really leading. Look at how that pivoted. Look at the relative strength that turned on a dime. And over the next month, as the market sold off into the third week in March, you can see how the relative strength of financials emerged beautifully. So during that sell-off, the healthcare sector actually outperformed the uh, S&P on a total return basis by 14%. So it was down along with everything, but it was down a lot less than everything else. Since that recovery, uh, some other groups sort of recovered a little more quickly than healthcare did, but overall, it's still holding up very nicely on a relative basis, still up 12%. Uh, relative since the uh, the market top uh, third week in uh, in February, so so overall still in a pretty decent relative shape. Now it's actually regained the 200-day moving average, regained the 50-day moving average, putting it back in a position of potential leadership. So the question is, where where are we seeing the leadership from? These stickers are a little crazy, so sorry for that. This is basically taking the healthcare index dollar sign HCX and taking the five industry groups that make up. Healthcare. And it's things like um, pharmaceuticals, biotech, medical supplies, um, uh, medical equipment, and, uh, and so forth. 
Uh, what you can see, if you look at, start at the market top uh, end of February, be, you know, sort of third week in February, and look at the price movements, the price returns from there to there, here in the middle in black, and it's probably hard to see it, so I'll just point it out to you. This is the healthcare sector down 8.8%, again, not on a relative basis, but on an absolute basis. Two groups actually did better than the healthcare sector, and those are the two, uh, two of the largest sectors or groups within healthcare. Pharmaceuticals, number one, which was down about 5%, and biotech, number two, which was down about 6%. So both of these down, a lot of things obviously still down from their market highs, but down less than the healthcare sector. If we look at the same combination, but look at it on a relative basis, now we're starting the clock at the market peak and looking at how things have done relative to the S&P 500. So I'm just using a series of ratios. This is not a perfect um, you know, measurement because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of apples and oranges in terms of um, the groups which are price weighted, sort of equal weighted groups, and then the um, benchmark is price only. So don't read too much into the actual values, but definitely look at the relative movements here. By my read, the two leading groups have really been driving the performance of healthcare, right? So pharmaceuticals up 17% on a relative basis using these indexes, biotech up about 15.5%, healthcare as a sector outperforming by about 12%. Then you have the other three groups that have been underperforming, medical equipment uh, up only 8%, uh, healthcare providers uh, up 6%, and then medical supplies, the only of the, of the five uh, groups of that, which have actually underperformed uh, over that period. So again, pharmaceuticals and biotech are the place to be if you look at where, where the leadership has been. Now I'm looking at the um, members of the healthcare sector and I'm sorting it in descending order by their scooter rankings. This is the stock charts, technical ratings, the higher the rating, the stronger the uptrend. And if you look at this industry column, you can see why biotech is so well represented there at the top um, because you have things like Regeneron, Vertex. Regeneron has been one of the better charts, obviously across the markets, um, not just within uh, healthcare, but you also see pharmaceuticals represented with Eli Lilly, um, Bristol Myers, BMY on here, Johnson and Johnson, all within the top 10 to 15. But what I would also point out, and this is one of the benefits of using the scooter rankings, it's not just those two groups. There are stocks within other uh, groups. So Centing Group within healthcare providers, Davida, DVA, uh, Humana, all in the top 10, uh, based just looking at that uh, group of, uh, of stocks. So what I wanted to do is just look at some of these charts of the leading uh, scooter rank stocks, so the top rated stocks within healthcare. Uh, Regeneron has been one of the top uh, stocks and actually out of our entire large cap universe, it's number one right now in terms of the, the overall trend. You can see it's up 2% today, but it's one of the few stocks actually making a new 52 week high today. So that is a very small handful of stocks uh, make a new closing high today. Not quite a new 52 week price high, but a new closing high today, breaking above the 510 level again. Next, we have Vertex Pharmaceuticals within the biotech space. So again, a lot of these names are in those, uh, are in the biotech or maybe the pharma groups. This is another one that's you know recently broken to new highs. Had a big move yesterday, but sold back toward the lows. Today, it's sort of holding those lows and closing back above the previous day's close. So again, the relative picture has been pretty consistently strong over the last couple of months. A little bit of a pullback, but overall still holding up very, very nicely. Sentine Group is actually a fantastic chart. If you look at this list of charts, you'll find some of these that are nearing a new 52-week high, but also making a new relative high, which is what I'm really interested about. So if you look relative to the spiders, it's actually making a new price high and a new relative high, You're near a price high, but at a new relative high. Compare that to Eli Lilly, which overall is testing long-term resistance, but a little down on the relative because other stocks have rallied so well. So I would, I would think as you're looking through this group, pay special attention to charts like this where we're breaking to new relative highs. Also pay attention to some of these that are testing key resistance levels. Eli Lilly is one I think that's a really interesting one to watch because 147.50 is a pretty decent resistance level. We're right there. And if stocks like this, like Eli Lilly, can eclipse those previous highs, break into a 52-week high, break above their long-term resistance, I think that could be very encouraging for the sector and also maybe potentially for the market as a whole. It's all the time we have for this deep dive. Again, that process that I walked through, if you recreate that using the tools that I just showed you on stock charts, you can draw a lot of really good conclusions, I think, about some of the stock specific opportunities within the healthcare sector. We need to take a quick commercial break. Be back with my guest, Jesse Felder. We'll see you in a minute.
Hey, everyone. Welcome back to today's show, The Final Bar. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close. Uh, we answered some of your questions in the Final Bar mailbag yesterday. We'll do another one uh, later in the week. So please keep your questions coming. The Final Bar at StockCharts.com. Always the best way to get your questions and your feedback our way. We'd love to hear from you and answer your question in one of our next segments. To help us make sense of, uh, of these markets, we've had some fantastic guests on recently, and I think today is one of the, one of the better ones I could find, which is Jesse Felder from the Felder Report. Jesse, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Dave. Absolutely. So before we were starting, we just started talking about the broad market S&P, and I brought up this chart. Uh, what are you seeing here? How, are, how is your toolkit, how is your perspective uh, uh, making sense of, uh, of the volatility we're in right now? Yeah, I just wanted to mention a few of the indicators I've been watching for the past few months to try and make sense of all of this. Um, you know, as we discussed before we went on the air, they're all available in my public chart list there on stock charts. Um, and uh, I guess one of the first things I was looking at is, you know, last year when the Dow made a new high, the transports failed in the mm -hmm. middle of the year. And that was kind of a, a, an important signal that I was watching, confirming kind of that economic signal. Um, I guess the Dow theory economics is more of an economic signal than a uh, than a price signal. But you looked at you know the relative strength, uh, relative weakness within the market and sectors like retail, uh, transportation, metals and mining, um, industrials were all you know falling super weak, while the market was making new highs last year. And part of that you know resulted in a, in uh, some breath warnings. We had some Hindenburg omens um, triggered on both the New York Stock Exchange and the Nasdaq. Uh, in February of this year, I think we had seven or eight signals in the New York Stock Exchange between January and February of this year, kind of suggesting breath was really not healthy, even as the stock market was making new highs. Also diverging was the VIX. We saw an interesting VIX uh, divergence with stocks making new highs and the VIX not making new lows, which was also interesting to see kind of at the lows after this sell-off. We saw, you know, the stock market uh, continue to kind of make new lows into late March, even though the the uh, the VIX had kind of bottomed uh, a few days earlier, which was kind of a, a, a that bearish signal flipping bullish. Um, and then we started to see some washout signals. Um, we saw the percentage stocks trading below their 50-day and 200-day moving averages get under 10% and under uh, 20 20% on the the 200-day. But I, I that one actually went below 10% also, which is really a rare kind of washout in breadth. Um, it's been a good buy signal in the past. Um, we saw in the, in the ride X ratios, another uh, indicator that I looked to stock charts for, it's one of the only places I can find it. Um, and you saw in the, in the ride X ratio, um, the, a kind of panic that we haven't seen among these traders for several years actually, where I follow the five day rate of change in that ratio. And uh, when, when, those traders are selling stocks hand over fist over a five day period. It's usually a pretty good buy signal too. So um, we also saw the, the, five, the 10 day rate of change in the uh, New York Stock Exchange advanced decline line, uh, hit a washout level too, where it was you know, declining at about two and a half percent over that 10 day period, which is a pretty good washout level. I'm waiting for now to see that one to show kind of a breadth thrust signal. If we get over 2% on the positive side, that could be a good breadth thrust signal confirming that uh, you know the lows that we've seen were a good you know, sustainable low. Um, we were, I think we missed out on triggering a Zweig breadth thrust, but that's another cool indicator stock charts um, offers. Uh, you just need to see um, that signal go from below 40 to above 60 within a 10 day period and we missed that window. Um, we had a chance to trigger that kind of late in March, but it didn't happen. But uh, I think the final breadth thrust signal that I'm looking for is I think a, a Ned Davis research one that you can also track on stock charts. And that's just um, when we see 90% of stocks trade above their 50 day moving average. It's a much longer term breadth thrust signal, but that's been a good one in the past. When you see that type of um, you know, overbought signal, it's usually a really good signal for longer term, uh, the longer term trend. So, so, I mean, every one of those examples, I feel like we could talk through in detail. Um, when you're looking at a chart of the S&P right now, you know, we've obviously we've run up so quickly. And so, you know, I think a lot of people are struggling to differentiate between a bear market rally that at this point you want to be either fading or staying out of the way of, or is this the beginning of something more significant? You know, what is your toolkit telling you about where we're at right now, you know, going, you know, retesting 2750 again? 
Yeah, well, the fact that we weren't able to get that Zweig breath thrust is kind of the first, you know, worrisome signal to me. I'm looking to, uh, to several others to see if we can trigger one of those, because sure. that would be a good sign that this is, this is more than a bear market rally. But I'm also looking at, you know, shorter term charts, um, you know, some intraday charts, one hour, two hour charts to kind of see what momentum looks like on, on that scale. And, uh, you know, I like your RSI divergences there. We had a bearish divergence, you know, in, in February, which is a pretty good warning signal. And then the bullish divergence was a good, was a good buy signal that we saw uh, last month. And I think you can kind of look for the same things on a one hour and two hour chart too, if you're concerned um, that if you're, you know, looking at a one hour chart and you start seeing some of those uh, RSI, you know, a bearish RSI momentum divergence in RSI or money flow or any of those types of things, those would be the types of things that I'd be looking at to um, start turning more cautious again and putting on, uh, putting hedges back on. That's such a great take. And we only have about 10 seconds left, but I would love if you'd indulge me. This was the poll that we asked our viewers out of these five sectors. Where would you focus on for opportunities right now? What, how would you answer that question? If I you know, to? I'm a contrarian by nature. Financials uh, should be benefiting from the, the yield curve starting to steepen again dramatically. Yeah. They're very, very cheap and they're clearly out of favor. So I, I really think financials are, look interesting right now. Such a pleasure to have you on, Jesse. That's such a good take. And thanks again for highlighting some of the things that you're seeing. Uh, all the best. Stay safe and hope to have you on again sometime soon. All right. Thanks, Dave. That was Jesse Felder, founder of the uh, Felder Report. As he mentioned, you can look him up uh, um, on our public chart list. If you look for Jesse Felder, you'll see him right here. Also on Twitter, at Jesse Felder. Jesse is a prolific social media uh, commentator, and I'd, I'd certainly suggest uh, following his comments, his thinking through all of this. We need to wrap up our show, though, and go right to the three and three. So at the end of every Char at the end of every uh, show, three charts in three minutes, we'll go very, very quickly through the three. Chart number one, we didn't talk a lot about non-equity asset classes. It ended up being a very equity-focused uh, show, which is great. Uh, but I did want to highlight and remi remind you that there are a lot of movements happening in a lot of different places. I think the TLT is a really interesting chart to look at. While stocks are sort of in this bear market rally phase, sort of rallying up to resistance, the question is how sustainable that is. You have bond prices still in a good uptrend coming out of the lows from uh, about two, two to three weeks ago, but just pulling back a little bit. I think that 162.50, 162, which comes from uh, previous support, also this Fibonacci level based on the rally out of the lows from, um, from the fourth quarter of last year can be really, really compelling. So as long as the TLT remains above about 162, um, it's remaining sort of in, in, uh, in bullish mode here. I think the concern and why this is one of my charts is the RSI is just testing that 60 level. And as you know, if you follow this show, in bearish phases, in bearish moves, you tend to fail around 60 for the RSI, which means you just don't have enough momentum to push yourself um, to further high. So I think the question is whether or not we're going to stabilize there, whether we're able to push to new highs and get above that RSI 60 level. Chart number two, and again, Jesse Felder, my guest today, was talking uh, quickly about some of the breadth measures he was looking at, the Zweig breadth, th breadth thrusts we've talked about previously, but also the percent of stocks above some key moving averages. As we've talked about, I think this is one of the indications that I think we were in a deeper bearish phase is when these breadth indicators got so bottom, so bumped out. I mean, below 10%, below 5%, almost 0% for the percent above their 50-day. Uh, Those have recovered a bit, but still relatively muted, right? So in longer-term bearish phases, these indicators tend to remain muted, remain low for an extended period of time. So I think it's a really interesting one to watch to see if more and more stocks are able to uh, break above some of those key moving averages. And finally, one other um, type of breadth we didn't talk a, a little bit about, I think, today uh, was advanced to decliners, but looking particularly at 90% up days and 90% down days. Again, we're still sort of digesting all the data for today, but it didn't look like quite a 90% up day, but really close today as we saw some potential follow through in a sustained up move, you know, in terms of what would tell you we're, you know, sort of quote unquote, all the clear starting uh, in the clear sort of feeling more upside momentum. I'd want to see more, you know, 90% updates showing you that most stocks, if not almost all of them are in more of a, uh, a bullish phase. If you start to see some down days uh, where the, uh, the bottom panel is, uh, is spiking, that tells you that we're seeing more dis distribution than we might want. And ladies and gentlemen, that's our show for today. I want to thank our guest, Jesse Felder from the Felder Report for joining us, helping us break down the activity. Please check out our YouTube channel for all of our previous episodes. A lot of good content on there. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great night.
Hey guys, Grayson Rose here with StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Remember, if you did, give us a like down below, leave us a comment, we'd love to hear from you. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial minds. We'll see you back here very soon. Happy charting, my friends.